All right, another quick video refuting a common Calvinist proof text that they use with their eisegesis to teach the false doctrine, and I'd say heresy, of limited atonement. Now, heresy uh, is something that can affect the gospel, okay, it can affect salvation. Not every heresy is necessarily a salvation issue, as in you believe that you go to hell, because there is there is a distinction between a heresy and then a damnable heresy, which is what the false prophets teach. Uh, limited atonement is a heresy. Uh, not necessarily that it's a false gospel, but it attacks the gospel, it attacks the nature of the gospel. You can have a Calvinist who preaches repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, but the problem is they believe that's only for the elect. That's the problem. That's limited atonement. And the passage is, there is no scripture that, uh, even if you take out a context, uh, explicitly or even implicitly teaches limited atonement. With the other four points of Calvinism, you do have verses, if when taken out of context, do seem to explicitly teach no free will or total depravity or, you know, all this other stuff or unconditional election, but there is no scripture that teaches a limit in the scope and scale of the atonement. Now, there is a limit in the application because Calvinists have a straw man of accusing you of universalism. Now, the extent of the atonement is unlimited. Anybody, ha salvation is available to everybody. Acts 10 43 talks about that. There's other verses as well. Now, the application is limited because basically not everyone is going to choose the gospel. Not everyone's going to accept salvation by Jesus Christ. You know, uh, Acts 7 51, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, you know, which kind of shows free will, by the way. But one verse they like to use is Acts chapter 20, verse 48. And again, just like with the other verses, there is nothing about the extent of the atonement taught in this verse. It's complete eisegesis. They're, what they're reading, I'll show you what they'll do. Acts 20, 28. Uh, so yeah, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the whole, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. I mean, it, it's very basic, but what they do is they use this as proof what they do is see what their eisegesis, they have the pre-commitment to their Calvinist theology. They read, uh, you know, feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And they think that that means he only purchased the church of God with his own blood. Because if they're using this to prove a limited atonement, he hath purchased, you know, with his own blood. And they're reading it, you know, it's the fallacy of, law, of negative inference. They're thinking that's to the exclusion of the non-elect. Where is that taught in the text? See, they're adding their own theology into the text. That's called eisegesis. They cannot just read it as it stands. There's nothing about the, the extent of the atonement is not even taught. And by the way, which he hath purchased with his own blood. If you want to go to parallel passage, Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of grace. This is the basic passage. You just read the Bible. It's just simply saying, you know, redemption, forgiveness through his blood. He purchased us, us with his blood. You know, if you're part of the church, I mean, he purchased you. I mean, it, how do you get limited atonement out of this? It's complete eisegesis. They are reading their own theology into the text. And by the way, if you want a good proof that the, uh, the uh, um, because you quote them verses like like you know he died for every man, he he died for the whole world. They'll they'll say that that's that's just all the kindreds or they'll have this other those little talking points. First Timothy four ten says you know he is the salvation of all men, especially of those that believe. You know First uh, John two verse one to two. You know, he had died, you know, he is a, uh, the propitiation not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, Calvinists can try to tiptoe around these verses. They have all these little talking points around these verses. Um, they cannot just read it. Those verses destroy limited atonement. And they destroy their little argument. Even if John 3.16 is just talking about all kindreds of men or all kinds of men, that still doesn't change the fact that 1 Timothy 4.10 and 1 John 2 verse 1 to 2 shows that Christ died for both the church and also the whole world. So, I wanted to show you guys that. Again, another great example of Calvinistic eisegesis uh, butchering the text and attacking the extent and of the atonement, as well as also the character of the gospel and, and the nature of the atonement, as well as really just the character of God. Because if you're born non-elect, I guess you're just predestined to go to hell. Now, before you accuse me of not understanding Calvinism, I have a blog post on my website showing John Calvin himself teaching double predestination. So less we're to think that John Calvin doesn't understand Calvinism. I could say a whole lot more on that, but the bottom line is, Calvinism is based off eisegesis, just like Roman Catholicism. And just like every other Protestant, Protestantism is really just simply modified Catholic doctrine. It's all that it is. Yeah, I could say a whole lot more on that, but not going to. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye.